Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the 11th annual Don Ricks Distinguished Keynote Address. My name is Sally Greenwood, Vice President, Communications and Societal Engagement at Genome BC. We are broadcasting this first virtual event today from the Terminal City Club in downtown Vancouver, located on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil First Nations, who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. A special welcome to the high school and university students from around the province and beyond tonight. You are the researchers, teachers, artists, business leaders, physicians, and entrepreneurs of tomorrow. Like the generations before you, it is your aspirations that will provide the new innovations and opportunities that will benefit future generations, much like Don Ricks, the person for whom this event is named, and the three speakers you will hear from momentarily. Don Ricks was an innovator and a philanthropist with a broad palette of interests, medicine and science, education and the arts. He was a recipient of the Order of Canada, the Order of BC, and one of the co-founders of Genome British Columbia. Don believed that technology and innovation were the fundamentals upon which to build the future of British Columbia. In a speech to the Vancouver Board of Trade, Don explained that technological innovation transcends all boundaries. He said, quote, not only does it create new industry sectors and new jobs, which in turn boost economic output, it also provides traditional industries with advances that allow them to be more productive and competitive. Most importantly, technology improves every aspect of life by coming up with new ways to address important social issues." End quote. Don was a visionary and a pioneer. Throughout his life, he looked for gaps and created opportunities to fill them. As a physician, Don saw the need for better diagnostics and helped to co-found a system of clinical labs across Canada, better known today as Life Labs. He had a keen interest in biotechnology, and as the chair of our board through our formative years, his influence on the development of Genome BC is still felt today. We should never lose sight of his vision or his spirit of collaboration. This has guided our trajectory over the last 20 years. After losing Don in 2009, we established this event as a way to recognize his legacy and inspire our community. Just like 2020 has been different for all of us, tonight's event too is different from previous years. We are bringing together the unique perspectives of not one, but three leaders who thankfully call BC home. Each of these extraordinary people has made an indelible impact in the fight against COVID-19 and helped to keep all of us a little safer. Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer, Dr. Carl Hansen, CEO of Abcelera, and Dr. Mel Cradgden, Medical Director of the BC Centre for Disease Control Public Health Laboratory. Dr. Pascal Spothelfer, Genome BC's President and CEO, will be our moderator for the panel. Before we get started, there are just a couple of things to know about today's program. Following the panel discussion will be a Q&A. Please use the Q&A option on your screen to ask your question anytime throughout the discussion. You can also upvote questions as they appear and we'll draw upon those most popular questions during the Q&A. You can also participate in the social media conversation on Twitter by tweeting using the hashtag DRDK2020. And with that, I'll hand it over to Pascal and our panel. Thank you for the introduction, Sally. And good evening. As Sally mentioned, this year's edition of the Don Rink's Distinguished Keynote Address is a little bit different than previous years. We may have thought that we would have been dealt lemons by forcing us to go virtual, but we have turned this into a classic case of making lemonade by having the privilege of welcoming an amazing group of panelists tonight. All three are doing their exceptional work right here in British Columbia, and all three have a profound impact on how we live through and overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists tonight. Dr. Carl Hansen is the founding CEO of Abcelera, an industry-leading antibody discovery company poised to push therapeutic programs forward and fight disease. Until August 2019, Carl was a professor at the University of British Columbia, where he co-authored over 65 manuscripts in the fields of microfluids, immunology, genomics, and nanotechnology. Dr. Bonnie Henry has been BC's Provincial Health Officer since 2018. 
She is responsible for monitoring the health of all British Columbians and undertaking measures for disease prevention and control. Dr. Henry's experience in public health, preventative medicine and global pandemics has extended throughout her career. And Dr. Mel Krasden is the medical director of the BC Centre for Disease Control's Public Health Laboratory, the medical head of hepatitis at the BC Centre for Disease Control and a professor in the UBC Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. Collectively, you are the three elements that are essential for our pandemic response. Mel, you and your colleagues are the early detectors and data gatherers when a public health emergency occurs. You provide the scientific evidence to inform the design of the public health response, and you support that response with ongoing research and by assuring the testing and data gathering capacity and operations. Bonnie, you then take all that data and other available information to develop the public health response and to make the critical decisions that allow us to minimize the negative population health impacts of the pandemic while balancing social and economic considerations until we have the means to deal with this virus directly. You're essentially buying the time for Carl Hansen and his team and other researchers across the world to develop the diagnostic therapeutics and vaccines necessary to beat the virus and allow the world to return to a more normal state of affairs, hopefully soon. Our goal today is to shed some light on each of your areas of responsibility and how you experience the unprecedented course of events this year. Following this introduction, you will each provide, you will provide us with remarks for five minutes, after which we'll engage in what I'm sure will be an animated conversation that will conclude with summarizing thoughts from each of you to close out this hours, hour, which will be followed by an open Q&A session. So let me please start with Dr. Mel Krasden. Mel, you and your team prepare for public health emergencies all the time, but this pandemic is obviously exceptionally impactful. Can you tell us how and when you adjusted your operations and what you did to most effectively generate the scientific evidence and supporting information to support Dr. Henry and her mandate? Thank you, Pascal, uh, for that introduction. So first of all, um, one of the roles of a public health lab and for public health indeed is anticipation and threat response. And in order to do that, you actually require highly qualified personnel. In the context of a laboratory, medical, scientific specialists, clinical specialists, technical and operational specialists. Those people, uh, like a cookbook, you can't just take a cookbook and, and make a good meal. You have to have those people actively participating in normal operations to determine their skills to assess the quality. And then fundamentally, if you want it to work, it has to be under what we call an academic framework because in an academic framework, you're always thinking about improving the services. And ultimately, it's about bringing uh, data together. It's integrating data so that you can really track the results of a test to an outcome. We knew that there were challenges in China with regard to a new agent, and we knew that in December. By January, when there was the report of this new virus, and then publicly reported the sequences of this new virus on the 10th of January, we essentially put together a in silico test that was scalable. And that test enabled us to begin testing about a week afterwards. And by the 27th of January, we were able to detect our first case. Being able to do that without depending on commercial companies gave us a lead time of about four to six weeks. And the other thing, we were nervous about this becoming a pandemic, so we actually deployed the test to a number of frontline laboratories. But we made a proviso, and that proviso is you wouldn't do the test unless you're sharing the data. Because we realized that normally it would take five years to share the data and you had to do it quickly. And that led to a dashboard that allowed us to track the turnaround times and the testing and who was testing. And that was a feature that we did not have in this province. Then we had the leadership of Bonnie and the government where you actually had trust in 
evidence and science that helped us respond to this pandemic. And as you know, we were involved in genomics in an early phase and worked with Genome BC very quickly to try and implement genomics. So genomics allowed us to discover this agent, and then genomics allowed us to track transmissions of a this agent. And with the help of Richard Harrigan and Natalie Prestigecki, we were able to quickly show that the strains affecting British Columbians were indeed related more to the US and to Europe, and there was the first case that we recognized from Iran. That genomics is also important to understand pathogenesis. And there has been some reports about a variant, a D614G variant. And the suggestion is that it is less virulent and more transmissible. But those reports are hard to integrate because you can't always show that something is less virulent unless you have good data to support it. And other people publish things that you have this deletion mutant that's less virulent. But if you look at the data carefully, you find that the people who do better are younger. And younger people do much better when they're exposed to this virus. So it really does show that to help Bonnie make her decisions, you have to integrate the data and provide it in a package. We all know we're now part of the next wave. And a challenge is test capacity. And here again, some of the efforts were to try and improve test capacity by introducing a swish and gargle technique. And this was done by Dave Goldfarb at Children's and Women's and Linda Wang at our site. And this is a way of actually making it easier to procure a sample. But again, a challenge is integrating that into the lab systems so the reports can go back to the individual as well as to uh, the reporting structure, the medical health officers when they're positive. We also realize that there are some groups in the US that say we should test everybody all the time. And Mike Amina at Harvard has been pushing to test 4.7 million Americans every day. And that's a challenge for our systems to be able to test uh, that at that rate. The next uh, point is we have these newer tests that can test people uh, early on in their infections at the point of care, and we need to figure out how to use that. You also are aware that there was serology. If we're back in April, we were thinking, oh, we could issue immunity passports, and we'll just do the serology. You've been exposed. You're immune. Perfect. Well, the challenge is, is in fact, that immunity is not durable. There have been reinfections. And we do believe that people who have been exposed will become immune for some period of time. But what we're learning now is that every single person who seems to be responding to COVID is also responding to normal coronaviruses that are circulating and affecting humans. So why this is important is there are a bunch of vaccines that are being produced. And these vaccines, last look at the London School of Tropical Medicine, there were 248 vaccines, 49 that are in, in production and assessment. And the question will be, how effective are these vaccines? And do they also, are they impacted by someone's prior non-COVID corona impact? We all realize that without vaccines, we're looking at another year, maybe two years of ongoing infections. There's a critical value to giving the time for the life sciences in British Columbia, which is very, very strong, to be able to help us address this pandemic. And I think it's through that, the data integration, and the calming voice of Bonnie Henry that will help us get there. That's the perfect segue. <laughs> so Bonnie, uh, dealing with, with public health emergency is obviously core to your job. And uh, it's not that you haven't been dealing with very, very serious public health emergencies like the opioid crisis before, um, before the COVID-19 pandemic hit us. But the COVID-19 pandemic was exceptional in that it evolved incredibly quickly with, uh, with enormous uh, impact. So how did you experience the process of switching gears, taking whatever scientific evidence was available to you and dealing with very incomplete information about an unknown virus 
and then come up with public health measures and adjust those as the scientific knowledge uh, expanded over time. Yeah. Well, this has been, as you say, a, a highly unusual year and um, being involved in preparedness for pandemics, infectious diseases is things that I've been involved with my entire medical career. And this year, I mean, who knew? Who knew that we'd be sitting here now and that everybody out there knows what our knot is, <laughs> you know, that we know what an epidemiological curve is, that case and contact tracing are things that people understand now in ways that we hadn't even a few months ago. But we were watching very carefully um, early on in this. We have a group of, of public health experts, and Mel's part of it, um, people around the world who watch these things. And we, it's very difficult to know which of those sparks that we see out there are going to turn into something that is more concerning. We've seen it with uh, SARS-1 in Toronto in 2003. We saw it with H1N1. And in some ways, H1N1 in 2009 gave us a sense of complacency, perhaps, because it wasn't a severe influenza pandemic in many places. And there was a sense that, oh, well, we know how to deal with this. We're not going to be hit with something that is going to cause things um, that are going to make us take those measures um, that we had been thinking about. So part of my role is, is to be involved in pandemic preparedness. And, and I took on this um, two-year time-limited role of chairing the Canadian Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Task Force in, uh, in, in 2011. And I'm still chairing it. But so I spent a lot of time um, looking at, you know, what are the important things that we need to do? What do we need to learn from the past pandemics, from things that we've been through before, from the, the work that we've done at BC CDC and, and other places across the country, integrating the lab, the genomic information, the data, the scientific data, the epidemiologic data, and the communications to the public? And how do we advise government on policies around these things? And so this, uh, uh, one of the key things that I brought from my past experiences was the need to build in things like ethical frameworks, understanding why we would take certain measures and not others, using the principles of, of doing the least harm and the maximum good and the things that are really important for us as a society when we're going through a crisis to be upfront about, making sure that we weren't discriminating against certain groups in responding to a pandemic. So these were all the things that were going through my head. As a matter of fact, last November, I was with an international group in Rome talking about um, what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions <laughs> to managing pandemics um, as part of our global um, pandemic preparedness. And who knew um, then in this wonderful fall afternoon in the beautiful city of Rome that months later it would be deserted and we'd be dealing with these issues and actually putting into force those things we were talking about. So part of my role, part of what we were doing in late December, early January, was on the phone with Mel and with others saying, what is going on? and recognizing early on that this was something that could potentially cause, um, wreak havoc. We were concerned that it might be an influenza strain. There was some talk about that going around. And we were on the, uh, very early on connected with the BCCDC, both for our surveillance networks that we had eyes and ears around the world talking about this, but also <coughs> to get the lab ready. We knew that if we could at least have a lab test, we would be light years ahead of where we were in SARS-1 in Toronto. And I think it's a testament to that relationship we have um, that very early on the BCCDC was able to, within days of the genome being published, um, develop an in-house lab test. And that really saved us. So my role was to take all that and then to put it out to the public in ways that people understood. These were the things that we needed to do to protect each other. These were the measures that we knew would work, even though we didn't know a lot about this virus yet, and that we would learn together and to be open and upfront. And I, I believe, and I still believe, that if we tell people what we need them to do, and uh, we tell them why, and we've been very upfront with presenting modeling data and all the data that we are looking at to help understand this virus and the impact of this pandemic, and we give people the means to do it, that they will do what we need. 
And we've shown that here in BC, that we've been able to translate that both to um, the politicians and the policies that we have in place and from a government perspective, but also really people in BC have responded. And they've responded by doing what we need to do to bend our curve and to understand our pandemic. And we need to keep that going because we're not out of the woods yet. Thank you, Bonnie. And um, Carl, I mean, talking about whirlwind and uh, life-changing things, uh, your team at Svelera has, done, has gone in overdrive um, uh, since you announced your focus on the novel coronavirus on January the 28th. Uh, you managed to mobilize significant financial support from the federal government. Uh, you raised venture money and you transitioned from quote unquote normal operations to become part of an unprecedented global effort uh, to develop therapeutics to treat COVID-19. So can you share some of your experience over the past 10 months um, at the forefront of this commercial research and, uh, and development efforts? Uh, thank you, Pascal. So it's, uh, it's certainly been a remarkable few months and one that we, like everyone else, did not anticipate. I think that my comments will be directed mostly towards uh, a lens of technology and how technology has a role to play in responding to incidents like uh, coronavirus and, uh, and things that happen in the future and in the past, as well as you know, the diseases that we're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I lead a company, Abseller in Vancouver. Uh, we're a company of approximately 175 people, and we are a technology company that provides solutions to the biotech industry, uh, working with companies large and small that are interested in searching through natural antibody responses, immune responses, to find molecules that can be repurposed as drugs. So we have spent uh, the last eight years building up an end-to-end -end platform for that problem and tackling what have been some of the hardest uh, problems in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but through that work, we also engaged with a program that was funded by the Department of Defense, uh, by the Defense Advanced Research Program Agency uh, in the United States that was actually focused specifically on this problem about putting in place a technology platform that could respond quickly to a pandemic outbreak. So for a couple of years, we had been adapting our technology, which allows us to search, to analyze, to decode, and ultimately to extract antibodies from the database of immune systems to find molecules that can be repurposed as therapeutics and making it faster and more efficient at searching through natural human antibody responses to find molecules that could be used as a therapeutic for a viral pandemic outbreak. Um, so we had a, uh, done a couple of capability demonstrations leading up to this, and this was you know, a, a test of the team and an opportunity to build a network both locally and also uh, with researchers in the United States, including some top virologists at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institute for Health in Bethesda. Uh, as part of that work, we uh, simulated pandemics twice. Uh, the first was on uh, an H1N1 pandemic, uh, the second was on uh, a coronavirus, uh, MERS, and we were in fact uh, on the phone with our colleagues uh, talking about a third capability demonstration or a, a test, uh, a pressure test of this uh, platform when the first patient was announced uh, in the US and that was in early January. Uh, so I was literally on the phone with our collaborators. Uh, the news came in and within an hour we had called an all hands meeting and decided that we would shut down all of the work in that program and in any other program that we we're working on with other partners uh, that was not urgent uh, to focus the full weight of the company on getting ready for the coronavirus response. The first step of that process was to access a uh, blood sample from a patient, uh, which we were successful in uh, obtaining from collaborators in the US uh, just before the start of March. And on March 1st, we applied our technology to scan through that sample and we're able to identify approximately 500 antibodies from that patient. Um, working closely with the NIH uh, and then with a partner, a pharmaceutical partner, Eli Lilly uh, in the United States, uh, we were able to take that group of 500 antibodies, uh, winnow it down to 24 leads, and only uh, two months after initiating the program had identified the single antibody that it was decided to bring forward into clinical testing. Uh, Eli Lilly then took it from there. They're a large pharmaceutical company with the capabilities to do the manufacturing and the clinical development. And that antibody went into first in human testing on June 1st. Uh, so to put that in perspective, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is many things, but it's certainly not uh, always fast. And normally a drug development program from initiation to clinical testing would take anywhere from three to five years. 
this was completed in a total of three months, uh, which to our knowledge is a, a world record in speed. And that molecule has since moved forward into five clinical trials, including three, uh, uh, three phase two trials and two phase three trials. And just last week, uh, based on some interim data in the phase three, there was a request made for emergency use authorization, uh, which we are anxiously awaiting the result of. Uh, so this was uh, you know, certainly unexpected. And you know, just to sum up the thought, I think it's a great example of why it is so important to have a vibrant uh, sector in science that works between academia, between government and the private sector, uh, so that we're in a position to move more quickly when, uh, when um, situations like this emerge. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if this has taught us anything, it's that the normal course of business, as one would put it, um, of taking anywhere from three to five years to get into clinical testing and 12 years to get to a product is something that we could revise and do much better on. Thank you, Carl. It's, it's interesting. Let me start with a general question. Let me start our conversation with a general question. I mean, everything mentioned, it shows that uh, it's, it's really a total scientific and research effort. Uh, it's not just uh, genomics or virology, it's epidemiology, it's mathematic modeling, it's uh, social behavioral studies, uh, mental health research, um, and, uh, and also uh, the business capability of the world to, to work cross-border. It's, it's an incredible array of capabilities that come to, that come to work. And so uh, you alluded a little bit to that, Mel. So how well equipped are we actually in BC? Um, to, to deal with these kind of situations? And what areas should we focus more on to actually become better? I mean, you mostly, you, you mostly worked with US partners to, to advance that. So anybody wants to kind of have an opening thought on that? I, I'll take a crack at that to get Great. started. I, I think um, you know, every jurisdiction feels like they were back on their heels uh, on an event like this. No one was prepared for it. And in hindsight, there's always things that we could do better. Uh, the U.S. Uh, certainly was in a better position, largely because uh, the bulk of pharmaceutical research and biotech industry exists within their borders. And those are the tools uh, to bring forward for the type of response that we're working on, not necessarily for the monitoring. Um, so if anything, this has highlighted uh, the importance of that sector, not just to the U.S., but internationally, uh, that we need a strong sector. Uh, and in Canada, uh, that we've had, you know, not just Epsilon, but other groups in government agencies and the private sector that have contributed very meaningfully and I would say are punching well above our weight on a per capita basis, that doesn't mean that there's not more to do. Uh, but there's, there's reason to be proud and there's also reason to double down on that and make sure that we're even better prepared for the future. I would say I agree with you on a number of things in that, uh, you know, when we look at uh, preparedness for pandemics, the U.S. and the U.K. were supposed to be way up there at the top. <clears throat> And unfortunately, they did not do very well with their coordination around epidemiology and surveillance and monitoring, and in particular, testing. And I think one of the advantages we have in BC in particular is an integration of epidemiology and the lab science, um, both in the BC CDC, but also in our regional health authorities, through our universities, and we're used to working with each other in a way that uh, um, many other places don't have that connectivity. And we're a relatively small community, which is good in some ways, also challenging when you want to scale up in a, in a big sense. Um, and, but we have seen really uh, the, the type of collaboration internationally and globally around some of these issues, um, particularly around the testing, around understanding what's happening in different places, supporting each other, that I've um, not seen ever. And we talk about it for uh, therapeutics, but also for vaccine development. The fact that we have um, now at least 15 vaccines that are in phase two or three or together. And we have regulators like Health Canada uh, speeding up their process so that it's not going to take five years to get something that's going to be a benefit to the population. But still maintaining those rigorous safety protocols, which I think is incredibly important. So it's interesting. I recall meeting with Bonnie and they said, well, you know, there's a lot of gaps in, in the points that I raised for our threat anticipation and response. And, you know, what, what this pandemic illustrated for, for me and us, I think, is that we do have many of the component pieces that enabled us to react pretty quickly 
So, you know, thanks to Bonnie and some of the approvals for data integration pieces, thanks to the deputy minister, uh, thanks to the Minister of Health, we were able to actually move some of these things pretty quickly. But one of the things that you, you sort of see, you get off the, you get on the track and, and you, you have to learn how to adapt quickly. And to adapt quickly, we have to, I think, be even more innovative and to use better tools that are out there that we're sort of struggling with because we have a lot of legacy systems and this has to connect to that. And we need to sometimes think out of the box. And some of that out of the box thinking comes from the kind of interactions between a vibrant life sciences sector, a fabulous public health leadership structure, and some of the investments in our educational system and uh, our public health system. It's interesting that you, you mentioned the collaboration within our ecosystem because through the genomic enterprise, so we have parallel organizations across the country, and uh, we see the differences between the provinces, not only from a capability point of view, because I think we're blessed having an organization like the BCCDC, which is unique in Canada. Um, and on the other hand, um, the level of cooperation within the various jurisdictions is very different. And BC seems to have a higher level of, of collaboration. But when we then look at the Canadian response to all of it, it seems that the jurisdictional barriers between the provinces and the different approaches are really causing a lot of headaches. And, and you must witness that. You both must witness that on a daily basis because it would be nice to have a bigger data set if only we could share the data with other provinces, wouldn't it? Mm, you know, this is probably the biggest failure coming out of SARS-1 SARS in 2003. You know, the, the public health agency was created after SARS to try and, and support a stronger coordinated approach. And I think in, in one level, we certainly have that. Very early on, we created a special advisory committee that was chaired by myself and the chief public health officer of Canada. We talk, we were talking daily. Um, we share a lot of information, but our systems are, are still very much fragmented. We have 13 or more health systems in this country and it's very challenging. But I will also say with this, with this virus, unfortunately, we are also experiencing different pandemics. They look different in different provinces and we got hit first in long-term care, for example. But the fact that we don't have a common, um, simple IT system that allows us to, sh to rapidly share information across the country has been one of our biggest challenges. And we should have been able to overcome that in the last number of years, but it's not, uh, it's not got there yet. Um, you know, I think this is another opportunity for us to, to refocus on some of those important things that we, we do need because we have shown, we have shown that whole genome sequencing makes a difference in how we react day to day. When we had the first uh, case in the world from Iran, we all went, well, I phoned Mel up and said, it's got to be a false positive, <laughs> you know, to check everything. And, but we were able to find out the, the whole genome sequencing told us that it was indeed a different virus than the ones that we were seeing in, in BC. And you know, it was a central event to the world. I, I would also just add the, the point that is integrating all of these little snippets of information into a cogent response. And I think that it's, it's not just about genomics. It's not just about testing. It, it's really about thinking through the system from one end to the other and integrating the data and, and being able to actually have Canada function as, as an integrated whole could help us all because I think it could strengthen our life sciences mm -hmm. and our productivity in, in many, many areas. So yeah. using your technology to the US essentially through this was, well, a, was yeah. a challenge. For um, us. Yeah, I, I would say we certainly haven't lost the technology. I think the reality was that we had a position within the world to respond quickly and that uh, borders didn't matter nearly as much as finding the right group to move that quickly to patients everywhere. So, uh, you know, that was the right thing to do. Um, of course, we are investing now on building some of those manufacturing capabilities here in Canada to have more autonomy. Uh, but coming back to Mel's point, I, I just wanted to, you know, emphasize through analogy uh, the importance of having the relationships and the communication lines in the network, whether it be between provinces or the health organizations uh, or between the private sector and government. Um, in our response, uh, you know, our technology is super fast. It's been optimized. But the big advantage was established collaborations with 
the big companies, with the government, uh, with virologists, with people that could get the samples. And that um, you know, pre-existing network is something that you do not have time to make in an emergency. Right? And everyone is going every different direction. If you have the relationship, you're all on the same page, you can move quickly. And so the, the personal factor and you know, getting a better line of communication, I think, is a, a thing that could be done in advance um, and that we could think about. Yeah, I'd just add to that point, Carl, because uh, we met with Carl talking about influenza and monoclonal antibodies. And it was through that relationship we subsequently tried to obtain some patients who would provide their blood to enable this technology to move forward. And I think you're absolutely correct. It is those relationships that actually allow us to be more effective uh, in all of our spheres. And one of the things that, that I did early on was um, get a, a, a strong a leadership to develop um, a research group network to look at what was happening with the clinical work, what was happening with around the world with um, therapeutics, with vaccines, with all those other pieces, and to tap into all of the different key research groups that we have here in BC. We have a number of different universities who do really great stuff. So Dr. David Patrick started that. We worked with the Michael Smith Foundation. We were able to get some uh, early seed money to do some really basic stuff um, that we had prepared for, mostly thinking about influenza. And then we've built on that, and there's uh, over $400 million worth of uh, research being done um, by people in BC because of that. And we were, when CIHR and others were coming out with grants, we were well positioned here because of those relationships to actually take advantage of that. I think that's a fantastic point. I'll just also, you know, uh, it's easy to lose uh, perspective on how far we've moved since uh, the last incident. And I, I'm thinking back to the SARS-1 uh, outbreak where it was the Michael Smith Genome Science Center that came up with the first sequence. And that was based on investments in genomics and fundamental capabilities. Uh, and it was not an easy thing to do back then. You know, technology has moved. Uh, now there are many labs all over the world that can do that kind of sequencing. And here in BC, through investments from Genome BC, from CHR, uh, you know, our company was formed that had a technology that could contribute to the next step of that. So you know, that's only, uh, I guess that's 20 years or so. Um, 20 years is not a long time in the, in the arc of technology. And where will we be in another 20 years if we stay on that track or if we even double down on those efforts? It speaks also to the point that even if some innovation or some research outcomes are not produced here, we still need the capacity to adopt them and, uh, and, and to work with them. And we saw that when, when, when Genome BC put in place a rapid response program to fund promising projects quickly. And that was our entire focus in that program. Within, within two weeks, we had 185 proposals. Um, not all of them were good, but <laughs> it speaks to the fact that there is a tremendous ingenuity and, and, and research capacity that is, that is available in BC that can jump on these things. But I think the weakness is, and you talked about the independence from commercial entities to develop a test. You go to the US to work with partners. So the industrial base we have in BC is still relatively weak to then pick up these ideas. And, uh, and I guess it would be helpful to have commercial partners that could do some of the work that you need to do, Mel. I, I would like to even flip that on its ear. Like if you can say, you know, we have been in a position, we had leading technology in both cases. Um, and while, uh, you know, we don't have the big companies that can really take that next step on a global scale, uh, we have clearly the basis from which to build those. Yeah. And, uh, and to criticize BC for saying you don't have the pharmaceutical industry that exists south of the border is, uh, you know, is an, an indictment that could be cast on every jurisdiction around the world except for the United States. So, so we're actually in a terrific place. Um, and given where, where biotech is as a sector, the importance that's recognized in all areas of health and now even more acutely in pandemic response, uh, I'd say this is a, you know, a, great, a great time to be thinking about how do we strengthen that position so that the next time we do have those global companies. So I would like to just answer, uh, just reply to one of your comments. So um, we had been speaking with Bonnie about, okay, how are we going to fund our genomic strategy for five years? And, and we were lucky enough to, to have some uh, funded research through Genome BC. 
And then I remember meeting with uh, your uh, colleagues and talking about, well, we've got this agent that's in China and uh, we need to think about it. And, and during that conversation, uh, we had, I had a call and that was our first positive. And so we were having that conversation and normally Genome BC, it's not that fast in responding to certain things. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But within a day you said, okay, here's some seed money, begin the work. And it's that seed money that helped us get some CIHR money. So it's, it's that relationships, it's that working together. And it's really about, I think, trying to really build on the synergies that are feasible in British Columbia. And maybe we can teach the rest of the country to do the same. Well, and fast and slow. I mean, Carl, you mentioned that things that take 12 years are now being ha are happening within months or under a year. So do you actually believe, and I, all of you, um, that once we have overcome COVID-19, um, we'll actually have learned lessons that allow us to maintain perhaps not that speed, but certainly a different kind of pace than we had beforehand? Or will we go back to business uh, as before and, uh, and the, 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 the regulatory frameworks, et cetera, that we had before um, and the willingness uh, to, to actually cut through uh, gone? Uh, what do you believe? Have we learned our lesson? I hope that we, we've learned our lesson. I mean, uh, there's been so much disruption uh, over the last little while. Uh, one likes to think there's a silver lining and the silver lining could well be that, that there's, uh, there's now you know, rock solid evidence that uh, the standard way of doing business on in all dimensions of biomedical research uh, can be improved. And, um, you know, when I think about what happened with us over the last few months, uh, the technology was a huge part of that. I do believe that we underestimate what investments in technology can do to drug development and that it's an area that's been, uh, you know, chronically underinvested in, ironically, because it's such an important sector. People focus on the drugs and not the process. Uh, that, of course, is what, what our company is, is setting out to do. But there are other things that are perhaps a low-hanging fruit. Like we, we made a collaboration with our partner, Eli Lilly. Uh, that collaboration came together in two weeks. And that's, that's a business transaction that normally would take a year. And it would take a year in the context of uh, a therapeutic program trying to fight cancer. And one has to ask themselves, is cancer less urgent for those that have it than COVID? And it's not. Uh, it's just that we've become accustomed to doing business that way and we can do much better. And certainly the other one has got to be um, the regulatory environment. And there's good reasons to have strict uh, regulatory review and very high bars. But uh, we also have to find ways to make that much faster. And you know, going from initiation of a program to uh, an emergency use authorization request within seven months would have been science fiction only 12 months ago. And I don't think that will be the normal course of business in the next few years, but could we get there? Why not? That's, that doesn't break a law of physics and it would make a big difference to patients uh, with all kinds of diseases. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think we've realized that we have a lot of processes that are involved with um, mitigating risk and what people think is risk um, could be swept away when they realize that yes, we can actually be safe and make sure that we have the safety protocols in place without having the, all the bureaucratic pieces that go with it. The other part that I think I hope we will continue to take with us when we, we go forward is the importance of, of having a Canadian um, basis for doing things. And uh, you know, we got out of the vaccine business in Canada quite a long time ago, unfortunately, and we no longer even have manufacturing capability within the country, although we're building that back up again. We didn't have the ability to manufacture PPE. You know, we're, Another one of those words that everybody knows what it means now. <laughs> um, you know, we were d dependent on China and the U.S. and uh, the, the rise of nationalism around vaccines, around um, equipment that's essential for people around the world is something that I find very concerning. You know, as much as we have spread out the knowledge, we've um, kept close some of the important pieces that help countries deal with this um, with this disease. So I'm hopeful that it will um, trigger that that understanding and ongoing need to support um, that the development that we need within the country to protect people as well. I think that's a great point. I'll just add to that that. There are some of those that one needs to have some autonomy on for preparedness. And so, uh, you know, one could call that nationalism, but it's really readiness and independence. 
Uh, and there are other parts uh, of what you just said where there's actually a strong economic incentive as well as a preparedness incentive to invest. And biotechnology in particular, you don't have to invent a case for why that would be good for the country as an economic driver, as well as uh, a contributor to knowledge and to products that help make Canadians and others healthy. So uh, as a sector, I think that's you know, one, of the, one of the places where the, the goals of being prepared and the goals of prosperity align very well. And of course, the mission of biotech is to help people. So it's, uh, it's one of the sectors that has all of that alignment and uh, one where I think BC and Canada is well positioned to, to grow. So I would like to echo what you just said, Carl, because um, while we were able to quickly uh, develop a test and share it in other locations, the, the methodology we were using was based on tried and true platforms. And, and then the province felt, okay, well, the solution is that we will purchase these commercial manufactured products, which actually have an end-to-end -end solution, put in the, the tube, out comes the result. And what's become clear with this global challenge is, is that the supply chain has been completely disrupted. And so we're back to this tried and true, less semi-automated semi processes. And then the need to be able to put forward those integrative technology solutions would help us right now tremendously. And yet they're absent because of the system. And, and so I do think that that's an important thing yeah. for us to, to think through because as you point out, what's being applied today to uh, COVID, COVID has shown us that it is destructive to the same populations who are already vulnerable and at greatest risk. And it's those populations who we need to reach out to better with technology with support, with diagnostics, so that they can have their health inequities reduced. So now we are in month nine or 10 um, of, of this pandemic. And uh, the question everybody has, okay, so what's next? Um, how do the next 10 months look like? And there is, there is a lot of conflicting and different um, views that are out there. And it's also different to sift through um, are, are statements made out of caution, out of avoiding accountability, or is it truly the best scientific understanding of, of where the situation is? So from a more personal point of view, um, how do you think the next six to eight months will play out for you? Besides probably not having much vacation. <laughs> yeah, a day off would be nice. Uh, you, know, you know what, we are in the middle of this storm. And the things that um, concern me right now are we are going to have to find a balance because we know the things that we put in place where we didn't know a lot about this virus and how it was transmitting. And we knew that it can cause very uh, exponential rapid growth and overwhelm our healthcare systems. We're not there anymore. We know a lot. We know about how to control it. We know about um, the things that we can do to minimize it. But it is also spreading in our community now. And we are not going to get rid of it in the next six months. A vaccine is going to take time. Um, it is going to be helpful and it's going to help us get through this. But we need to get, um, we need to continue in that balance that we've been trying to find of controlling it in the community, protecting those people who are most at risk of severe illness and death, but also making sure for our community wellness that we have children in schools, that we have people back at work. We know the unintended consequences of what happened in March are also having effects on people's health. And as Mel said, this virus has exposed the inequities that we have in our society. And right now we have to do everything we can to minimize those negative impacts on those people that have been impacted. And that's you know, women getting back into the workforce, racialized populations. We know indigenous people have been differentially negatively affected by every past pandemic. So my focus for the next six months is how do we keep our community well and live with this virus, keep our schools open, keep children in, in classrooms, support communities to get through the next six to eight months until we have a vaccine. No. 
Bonnie has highlighted the challenges that we face. Um, I think, and I look at it from a bunch of perspectives. So one perspective is I'm not a fierce proponent that you solve yourself, your problems by testing everybody. But I do believe having a capacity to test people, return the result very quickly so that you can modify your risks of transmitting is very important. And so we're trying to figure out the technology solutions to that. And, and they're not trivial because everybody else is trying to come up with the technology solutions to that. The second thing that I find very interesting is to understand the immunology of this virus. So Carl has outlined that his technology detects <clears throat> the antibodies to the virus. But what's very clear is that and I mentioned this earlier, that everyone who's responding to this virus is responding to the historical viruses that they've seen in the past, the non-COVID coronaviruses. And it, when you think about the challenge, until you understand how those two things interact, do, are they interfering with the response? Are they benefiting the response? Do they lead to immunity or do they make it worse? We need to understand that because we're gonna soon have an array of vaccines that we're gonna to need to give to our population. And we're gonna to need to understand whether those vaccines are safe, are they effective? And to measure that, you can think now that we need to have the tools to measure whether or not someone who got a vaccine is safe today, tomorrow, in two years from now and even a lot later on. And to do that, you're gonna need the data integration. So I think if we set our path now, we can solve some of these things together. Um, so uh, in our work, we're focused on bringing forward solutions, uh, you know, therapeutic antibodies, which are not a vaccine, but have a place immediately uh, to help those that are sick or that are at high risk. Uh, and also that I believe will continue to have a place as vaccines roll out. Uh, they won't be perfect and it'll take some time. Um, so I, I won't make comments that are you know, nearly as broad as, as Bonnie and Mel have made, which because they're actively engaged in looking at the big picture today and monitoring, you know, what are we doing in policy and in testing uh, to help the virus? Uh, instead, I'll just you know, use Epsilon as a microcosm of what everyone's doing. Uh, so we have uh, people who are you know, working hard on, on their jobs that are important. Uh, and they're trying to bring forward better therapies and technologies for coronavirus and for other diseases. And we, like everyone else, are doing that in the backdrop of constraints of distancing and dealing with, uh, you know, constraints at home and the stresses. And uh, one of the things that's been uh, heartening uh, for me is to see uh, how resilient uh, the team has been um, and how they have, you know, made a lot of personal sacrifices to bring forward a solution that, that now is on the verge of actually making a difference for thousands, maybe even more people moving forward. So uh, that's something that we're fiercely proud of. We're going to continue to do what we can. Uh, and I think that is uh, not an exception in our community. I think there are groups like that in the private sector, in government, uh, in, um, in, in academic labs that are, that are all making do. Uh, and if we do that, that's going to be one of the more important things uh, as Bonnie said, to protect our communities, but also to make sure that we're not uh, losing sight of the other factors that have unintended consequences in economics and uh, and social. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's also interesting for us as a as a as an ecosystem builder and as as a funder of uh, of of research and innovation on how we can contribute to that to that ongoing effort. Uh, because I remember we were saying, okay, so let's help research to get off the ground quickly. But then the question was, how long do we do that? At what point is kind of initiating research kind of too late uh, to respond to that, uh, to, that, uh, to that pandemic? And at the same time, looking at it now, we're going, this is not over soon. Uh, so there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. So if you look at um, agencies like ours, um, we have certain means to fund uh, things, uh, government and other research support organizations. What kind of things would you kind of tell me we should do? Uh, great question. You put me on the spot a little bit. I wasn't prepared for that one. Um, I like to think that uh, what, where the biggest value lies is normally 
in working on the important thing that not everyone is working on. And so I think there is a very interesting challenge here that uh, there are so many obvious areas where we need, we need more work in COVID. Um, and someone needs to be doing that, but many of those are, are highly subscribed, uh, both locally and around the world. Uh, and I, I think I would pull back a little bit and ask the, the more general questions. Like, what is the fundamental uh, scientific question that would not just be applicable to COVID where there is an immediate need, but that would then allow me to uh, pivot into another area or apply that new knowledge into a new sector? Um, and those, uh, those general questions and capabilities uh, tend to be some of the most productive things for academia to work on. And when they get to be very focused, uh, normally private companies are better positioned to really execute on that. And when there is a problem as urgent as COVID, you can be sure that they are. So I, I think I would pull back a little bit and ask the bigger questions mm -hmm. that are, are trying to get a step ahead of where we are today. That's not much of an answer. <laughs> no, actually, it is an answer. And at, at first, it was very slow. It took us quite a long time. And, you know, we're, we're aim, our aim is to sequence every genome of every positive case that we have here. But it, 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 it's hard to, uh, hard to underestimate how much it changed our way, our focus. It was knowing um, that we were getting flooded. We had two super spreader events, and it was the whole genome sequencing that supported us in understanding that. And we had one which was a dental con to uh, hundreds of people. The other one was getting flooded from Washington State. And it was really what enabled me to go to the premier and the minister and say, we need to do this now today to stop people from traveling to Washington State to, to make these changes, because this is, this is what we're seeing. And so it, it's, you know, we start, we give seed support, but then we need ongoing support through these crises right now to keep these important measures going. We're using it now to help us understand outbreaks that are happening. Um, are they all the same or is it being introduced from different places? And it, it's, um, it's a, a, a new way of thinking that helps us do epidemiology in a different way that has been extremely helpful here. And I think we're the only ones in the country that are using it that way. I, so I, I'd actually, I think both of those fit so well together because the point that Carl highlights is, is the fact that we're all stressed out with COVID and it's going to hang around, it's going to drive us nuts. But there, while COVID is going on, there's salmonella outbreaks. There's climate change, which people don't believe <laughs> is occurring, but that climate change is going to affect how the environment, uh, the food supply, and we're going to need to use genomics to better understand what are the threats to us as a society. And so when you think about the, the things that need to be done, it's really about can you sequence it? When do you need to sequence it? Can you integrate the data? Can you create that package that gives Bonnie and her team the information to say, oh, we have a threat from this source, it's a food source. Can we respond to it and reduce the risk to British Columbians and other people? And then as you pointed out at the very beginning, you need to share it because the food supply we get is from various parts of the world. It affects us, it affects those in Ontario. You need to share the data. You need to figure out those pieces. And then you have the technology sector and they can make it sing. And that's what we need. So you need to figure out how to do that. Yeah, and I think um, we, have, we have only a few minutes left um, in, in, in our conversation before we move over uh, to, uh, to, to the Q&A. But I have to say, kind of reflecting on our conversation and, and going back to what this event is, it's Don Rick's distinguished keynote. And uh, listening to, to you and seeing how BC has responded to that amazing event, um, I think uh, one person will be proud about the response, be it from a technology, from an entrepreneurial, from a company point of view, be it from a public health leadership point of view, and how a, a depoliticized response was possible uh, in this province. And I mean, talking labs, 
um, the, having that infrastructure available to provide the information that allows us or that allows you to make, to make these critical decisions and to see that collaborative effort within our community, not just within uh, silos, but across silos and between academia, industry and the public sector has been actually a fabulous, uh, a fabulous experience. And that's kind of the silver lining that, that you mentioned, Carl. And uh, I think our responsibility, uh, I was actually afraid of your answers, Mel, because I was expecting a whole wish list of things that we could do for you. But we as a, as, as a funding agency and as an ecosystem builder have really to build on that and take that strategic approach that you mentioned, Carl, and look at the gaps and, and look at them strategically in consultation with our stakeholders, but also respond tactically to the immediate re, re, um, requests and requirements that, that we have in the system. So this was a fabulous conversation. And um, I would now like to uh, turn it over uh, to our public Q&A, and I'm sure that we'll get some very interesting questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for sending in your questions to Slido. And also, as a reminder, you can upvote questions uh, so they uh, rise to the top of the pack. And uh, our apologies in advance, we only have an hour, so we will probably not get to all of your questions, uh, but we'll do our best. So let me start with our first question, and it's for you, Bonnie. So Dr. Henry, are we going to go into lockdown if the cases continue to rise? You know, that's, <laughs> that is a very good question. It's something that we're we're all um, concerned about, um, particularly in the last few weeks as we've seen numbers increase, particularly in some parts of the province. But I, I would say in British Columbia, we never went into a lockdown in the same way that we've seen in, in other parts of Canada, but certainly in Europe and other parts of the world. And our plan from the very beginning of our restart was it was one way. And what we want to do and what we are doing is learning about where this virus is being transmitted and where the, uh, the super spreader events are happening. And we're titrating our response to make sure that we can reduce those possibilities and uh, keep open the things that are important. And we talked about that a little bit, about how important it is for our healthy communities to have schools open, to have workplaces open as much as possible. So we're focusing on the, the COVID safety plans, and now's the time we all need to go back and look at those. We're focusing on the things that we need to do individually, and right now that means keeping our group small. It means not having Halloween parties. It means not having uh, large weddings and gatherings in our homes when we can't maintain those safe distances. Because those are the things that we're seeing now that we're, this virus is being transmitted. And we, need to con we will continue to do that. And the other part of it that allows us to keep this going is the, the tremendous work of the public health teams doing the contact tracing. That helps us find people, understand where transmission is happening, and uh, keep us open and moving. But it is everybody. We need to regroup. We need to keep our social connections small so that we can continue with those important things in our community. And it's up to everybody now. It's up to all of us to do our piece now. So in that you're using a number of tools and one of the questions is, and I, I'll direct that to Mel, is uh, how genomics and genomic data uh, is helping to inform public health and policy decisions? For this virus, uh, it was very helpful to be able to sequence the genome of the virus very quickly to help inform us about the location uh, whether something was being imported into the province. That's a little different now with the borders closed. But uh, the use of genomics is largely to try and understand if you have an outbreak, are there multiple sources to that outbreak or are they from a single source? And can you link that in a very rapid fashion with the, mm -hmm. di the testing, the results, and, and the contact tracing? So question for, for Carl, and Carl, you had a, you had a, uh, Ella Lilly had a pretty big announcement that is affecting uh, Abcelora this morning. Congratulations. And uh, so one, uh, if you want to comment on that deal briefly, and uh, an add-on question is uh, whether 
other companies use a similar technology uh, as Upsera and what makes your technology unique? Uh, sure, thank you for that, Pascal. So uh, for those that don't know, uh, this morning there was a press release from our partner, Eli Lilly, uh, which we're working, on, working with uh, to help develop a therapeutic antibody for the treatment of patients that have been infected with COVID-19. Uh, that particular drug is being tested for multiple patient groups. Uh, that includes patients that are in the hospital, uh, patients with mild to moderate infection uh, that are not yet in the hospital, and also prophylactic uh, treatment for those patients that are at highest risk uh, in care homes uh, to make sure that we can prevent infection spread for the, those, those patients that are uh, most susceptible to getting sick. Um, so a few weeks ago, we had uh, an announcement of an interim phase two data that uh, suggested that the treatment of the mild to moderate patients, those that have been infected but have not yet become very sick, uh, allowed for a very substantial reduction in the rate of hospitalization, so approximately a 70% reduction, uh, which uh, in, in these types of trials is a, is a very big signal uh, and reason for hope. Uh, based on that, Eli Lilly had made a recommendation for emergency, auth uh, emergency use authorization, which is still pending with the FDA, um, and we are you know, uh, optimistic that will come forward soon, although of course it's not in our hands. Uh, this morning there was an announcement that an agreement was made between the FDA and Eli Lilly, um, or the US government and Eli Lilly, I should say, uh, for the purchase of 300,000 doses and the ability to, to ratchet that up to a million doses over the next half of a year. Um, so that is an important step. Um, and uh, I think very laudably, uh, Eli Lilly has communicated their policy on pricing and availability uh, where they're going to be uh, distributing this drug um, based on need amongst patients in countries all over the world. Uh, they're going to make sure that it is distributed in a way that does not cost patients. Um, so the governments are going to pick up the cost. And also they're going to change the price uh, in relation to the ability of governments to pay. So I think that is exactly what one would hope uh, would happen. And uh, we're very proud to be part of that collaboration. So still one, one step left. It still needs to be approved for all that to, um, uh, to move, uh, move into action. Um, but uh, uh, we feel like we're on the verge of having contributed a therapeutic that could help millions of patients. Um, so that was the first part of your question. Uh, and I, I probably already talked at, at some length. Um, the last part was, are there other companies with our technology? Um, the short answer is no, that it's a technology that was developed uh, here in BC. And in fact, uh, originally at UBC, uh, based on some funding from Genome, uh, Genome BC when I was a professor at UBC. Uh, since then, we've expanded around that and built many other technologies that help to build a complete workflow from uh, the definition of a drug discovery problem to a final therapeutic. Uh, there are other companies doing great work all over the world in a similar space, but ours is unique and we believe has some significant advantages in speed and flexibility. So uh, maybe I'll leave it there. Fabulous. So talking technology, um, Bonnie, when will we activate the COVID app in BC? So the COVID app, a, federally, um, a federal initiative, and I think it was deployed in Ontario. And mm -hmm. uh, so what about BC? <laughs> Yeah, the, you know, this is a, one of those challenging things. We've been talking with them from the very beginning about where an app would be helpful and where um, it, it uh, has not been shown to be helpful, let me put it that way. And uh, it, unfortunately, it was developed by people who uh, didn't have the public health perspective in mind. And we have been working with them uh, since uh, you know, the spring when they first uh, looked at this, there were a number of apps developed in other countries and a couple of other provinces, uh, particularly Alberta had developed one in host that they were evaluating. Um, but this one uh, took over and I do believe it is rational for us to have one app in the country. The challenge we have is that right now it uh, does not meet the needs and it's causing uh, some challenges uh, for those provinces who are using it because it, uh, it, 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 they have focused rightly on privacy, but that means that there's no way of actually determining what we would like the app to do, let me put it this way, is um, to be able to notify people who were within six feet of a phone who has it, so we don't need to we notify a phone that's within um, six feet of a phone at particular times when we know there's risk. 
right now it, notifi it notifies anybody for 14 days prior to somebody becoming ill. And we know that people aren't infectious for 14 days before they become ill. So what that means is there's going to be people, and we're seeing this play out in, in Ontario, who get this notification, you've been, and another problem we had with it was the language, it says you've been in contact with somebody with COVID. And that's not true. What it means is your phone was within six feet of somebody at some point where they may or may not have been infectious. So we have asked repeatedly for them to at least um, limit the time frame uh, that these notices go out. And what we really would be useful would be to su supplement our public health um, contact tracing to be able to say, I want to send a message to people who were within six feet of this phone, or phones that were within six feet of this phone between uh, nine o'clock on Friday night and one o'clock in the morning when they were at this event. And uh, so far, we've not been able to have a meeting of minds about how to make that happen. More work so is I required. have no problem with the, the app and if the federal government will support um, people and follow up and answer all those questions that come when people get a notification that we have no way of telling them mm -hmm. what the risk really is with this one. So it's unfortunate. So the next question is around vaccines and I'll redirect uh, the first part of the question to Mel and then the second part will go uh, to you, Bonnie. So uh, Mel, um, do you believe we'll have a vaccine ready? Uh, in the first part of next year? Uh, certainly there will be vaccines. I think the question that we're all trying to solve is what is the safety of those vaccines <clears throat> and whether or not with the current uh, viral infections there's very good evidence that you're losing the antibody very quickly. And so the question will be does this vaccine actually produce a good antibody response or an immune response to the vaccine? And then is it going to be protective? There are some concerns in the literature about whether or not prior exposure to uh, non-COVID coronaviruses could interact with this vaccine. And so there's a lot of work that needs to take place to make sure that these vaccines are safe and they do provide the immunity that they, they need to. And then I'm sure Bonnie will explain some of the other challenges about how do you deploy the vaccine, who do you deploy the vaccine to. And that's actually exactly uh, the next question. So what criteria will be used uh, to, uh, to guide the, the administration of the COVID vaccine and its distribution? Yeah, so there's a couple of things, and this is, and I talked a little bit about ethics and ethical principles. So we have a National Advisory Committee on Immunization in Canada, and they have been focusing on identifying <coughs> if and when a vaccine is ready, uh, how do we best make sure that those most in need uh, receive the vaccine first? So we do have priority populations, but what we're wrestling with, as Mel said, is there's several different vaccine candidates, at least uh, uh, seven or eight of which are very likely to become available in the first quarter of next year, for which Canada has some um, stake in. Um, so, but they're not going to be available in large amounts to start with. So we need to figure out what, who is the best population to start with. And obviously the people we want to start with are those who are most at risk of having severe illness from this. We want to make sure healthcare workers are protected, other essential workers, people who are at risk by the, their environment, um, so certain congregate housing, certain communities. Um, so there is a framework, an ethical framework that we're working through nationally to make sure that we can do that. And of course, the other part of it is the logistics of how do we get vaccine to people. Um, some of the vaccines that are in production uh, are require fridge stable, um, which is what we're used to. Our vaccine distribution is able to handle that. Some need minus 20 and some need super minus 80 deep freeze. So um, we also don't yet know which vaccines are going to work, work best in which populations. Will they work as well as in older people and younger people? And that will change our strategy a little bit. But um, those are all things that are, we are working on. So one of the challenges uh, seems to be that we, we, where every time there is another step, it's in, in, into unknown territory in a sense. So now the unknown territory, for instance, is so how are we going to vaccinate um, all Canadians in a, in, a, in a very short time? Uh, and uh, um, 
Carl, you had to gear up very quickly uh, to do the antibody screening. So probably a, a question for all three of you is what kind of steps would you recommend should we take for the next pandemic so that we're ready? Um, each from your different perspectives, be it from private industry, being from, from the lab side or from a public, uh, public health uh, side. Who wants to go uh, first with that one? <laughs> Carl, I'd do you want to take, um, uh, take that on? Yeah, so maybe just to set that up, um, you know, a little bit of background to what happened recently with, with COVID-19. So uh, we have um, been able to contribute a therapeutic that now stands at the front of the pack in the world for a therapeutic antibody is COVID-19. And that came on the heels of a sustained investment by our company to build antibody discovery capabilities. And in particular, a two-year effort with the Department of Defense that was specifically focused on rapid pandemic response. Um, so over two years, we pressure tested the platform, we made connections, we figured out the bioinformatic, the data transfer, all of that. Uh, and it was because of that that we were able to move so quickly. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near where that technology can go or where that preparedness can go. And so uh, one of the things I think this really highlights is that uh, not waiting for the emergency, not being back on your feet, but rather uh, knowing that there will be something like this in the future, that it has the potential to be uh, very disruptive. Um, and that by preparing for it, by getting the science, the technology, the relationships, the policies, uh, even the response in terms of um, allocation of funding uh, to relieve financial stress. All of that could be done ahead of time. Uh, and, you know, if anything, this is probably a wake-up call. So from our perspective, uh, we see this as the very beginning. We are going to continue to build up capabilities. Um, and I'm confident that, you know, should it happen again in five years, 10 years, 20 years, hopefully longer, uh, we'll be much, much better prepared than we are today. Yeah, I, I'd say uh, yeah, that's a really good basis to start. And uh, when when things are going well and public health is doing its job, um, we're easy to neglect. And we have whittled away our public health systems. Uh, we've whittled away our ability to do coherent surveillance of, of diseases across the country. Um, and we don't have the depth and redundancy and um, surge capacity in our public health workforce. And, experts in disease tracking and epidemiology and all of the important things that we have um, in place. And when the tyranny of the urgent uh, in acute care comes along, it's very easy to, to whittle away at public health. Um, and I'm hopeful that this will remind us again how important it is to have that, um, that workforce, that buffer zone, that safety net that public health plays in many different aspects of our communities. And, and this pandemic has shown again how important it is. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in data integration. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tools that have come together in British Columbia are a step forward. But if, if you think about what the challenges are, it's <clears throat> our ability to know who's infected, where they are, were they tested, were they negative, were they positive. And that <clears throat> information has to feed back into the contact tracing and the rapid response to enable us to open our economy and to do so safely without lockdowns. It's that same tool, those sim similar tools are the ones that you require to measure whether someone got their vaccine and what's the long-term outcome for their vaccine, mm -hmm. and monitoring that and integrating that piece of data. What's clear to me when we look at those systems we use, you can go to a grocery store and you have the barcode and it's all linked. And we're still very paper-oriented in our system and it slows the process. So I think we need to take a bite from modern technology, adapt it to our health system, and I think having that kind of information, I think, helps inform uh, industries like the one, uh, Abcelera, to look at what's going on in the, in the system quickly and then respond. It's, it's kind of, uh, it, it ties into another question that, uh, that is coming in on Slido. Is, um, we, had the, we had the SARS um, 
pandemic in 2003, and it has led to some changes, like PHAC, uh, the, the, the um, Public Health, Public Health, Health Agency created. of Canada, was founded at that point. So, what might be the legacy of COVID-19? Mm. From a public health perspective, I hope it is um, being able to realize um, a public health information system that allows us to integrate the information we're collecting uh, across the country. That was um, a dream that came out of uh, SARS-1 that I was involved in, um, but we, we never realized it. And we are seeing the, the challenges that we're facing now. Um, we all have different ways of collecting the information, putting it into a database and sending it to the public health agency so that we have a national picture of what's going on, whether it's the lab testing. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that that will finally move ahead. Um, I think there's, a, I do want to recognize that we're many steps ahead of where we were in 2003 in terms of um, guidance that we're providing, uh, working together across the country, sharing information, but we're not yet where we need to be. And we also, of course, have recognized there are parts of our system that we have failed, um, including long-term care. And we need to take a different approach to integrating long-term care into our health care system. Um, it's always sort of been a little off on its own, and that puts people at risk, and sometimes the, the people who are the most vulnerable in our populations. I would just like to also add that I think uh, what Carl and his company has shown is you need a long-term investment into people and highly qualified people who are across many, many disciplines. It's laboratory, it's epidemiology, it's public health, it's scientists. And it's through that kind of interaction that you can be prepared and those individuals have to be doing day-to-day -day work and then they can be called on during an epidemic. Yeah. You, you use the word investment, and that's, I think that's, that's one of the key questions. So from a public point of view, uh, we tend to forget uh, the cost of unpreparedness, mm -hmm. and uh, then we don't put the money into the preparedness. And from an investor's point of view, uh, to, to more the private sector call, um, how long is the memory of the investment community to actually yeah. invest in, in the preparedness and into companies that contribute to preparedness. In your case, it was DARPA that investment. It wasn't, it wasn't venture capitalists. Yeah, I, I had, that's a great question. Um, I was gonna answer the previous question and say that you know, the, the silver line, one of the silver linings of this um, will be that uh, it has really put a spotlight on infectious disease research, which in mm -hmm. biotech is an area that has been tough to get funding mm -hmm. and resources to for some time. Uh, whereas everyone, certainly everyone here, and I think if you just uh, you know, look globally at what some of the biggest problems are, um, infectious disease remains uh, one of the big problems that faces humanity. So getting more effort and technology on that problem uh, is something that has happened already. Uh, and I suspect, you, know, you asked about memory, I suspect that will not tail off right away. So there's gonna be, uh, it'll be a decade before people uh, start to be as complacent about uh, you know, drug-resistant bacteria, new viral pandemics, uh, even the viruses that come around seasonally that are a problem. Um, so, you know, that would be my, my, my first response. And you also mentioned uh, DARPA, and it's, uh, it's you know, j just sort of has some interesting back uh, backstory of that. There's another agency, of course, BARDA in the U.S. that does some of the larger translational work and has been heavily involved in the pandemic response. In fact, BARDA was started by a venture capital group in the US many years ago. Um, and they made investments and got that agency going, uh, but didn't stay the course because one of the challenges with pandemics is that uh, they don't come every year and it's hard to, to maintain that, that long effort. So, um, you know, uh, finding ways to uh, boot up the public sector uh, effort and the private sector effort uh, and have them working on things that are adjacent, but where the capabilities can cross over, I think is the most effective way and we have no shortage of infectious disease problems, so I'm, I'm hopeful that will be uh, an area of growth moving forward. Um, so let's get, let's get back. We talked a little bit about, about the future. Uh, let's go back into, into more, more of the, of the present. Um, Mel, um, if you could have like a wish list of things that you could implement right now uh, to improve the response of, of your agency, what would it be? Where do you see the, the where do you see the gaps uh, that you need to, to 
to well, <laughs> it's a long wish list. I think <laughs> part of the challenge is, is to streamline the process whereby someone can get tested. And, and what's clear is uh, having people in a lineup uh, getting a swab in their nose is uncomfortable. So one of the efforts we tried was to try and use these uh, saline swish and gargles. It's bringing that information and testing either it on site rapidly or through a system rapidly, but also the individual getting their result uh, immediately by text or email, and some of that's already been created. But it's also taking that sample and then doing the whole genome sequencing so you can understand, okay, where's this, where's this transmission occurring from? And then relaying that information to the public health uh, group so that they know where they need to focus attention. Um, so it's all of these pieces that come together. And then as a society, we are going to have climate change. We are going to have... Um, changes in vectors, and it points to what uh, Carl has highlighted, that infectious diseases are going to be transmitted. Having this capacity is the way we can react more quickly in the future, and that's what I believe needs to happen, and I'm hopeful that some of the legacy of this event will be some of that integration and the infrastructure to do it. Yeah, no, I'm with you there, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> but I, I, I think the other things, I, mean, I think you made a comment, we were talking earlier today about, you know, we haven't, uh, we've sped things up in pulling things together um, in ways that, you know, haven't broken laws of physics. So <laughs> there, that we've shown that you can do things in a more coordinated and quickly um, and safely. Uh, I would like to see right now, if I had my brothers, I'd like to see us all being able to enter in a piece of information once and use it where we all need to use it. Um, we still don't have that. Um, and having more, we, we've evolved um, even in BC where we only have you know, five geographic regions and PHSA and it, it, we've managed to evolve so that we all have our own little systems and we have had with a crisis like this to pull those systems together. And if we, not only the IT systems, but I'm talking about the, the cultures and the way that we do things and the people and the, the way we're structured in our health system, um, each health authority is structured slightly differently, and, and that, when you're dealing with a crisis that's affecting all of us, can become a barrier and it can slow things down being able to manage. There, there's a good way of, of trying different things and, and uh, supporting people, but what we found with this virus and this pandemic is that you need to be able to be nimble in moving surge, whether it's people or um, testing capabilities or understanding different outbreak responses, and uh, we're still struggling with that, um, and we need to do better. Uh, May, you mentioned testing, and I haven't, I haven't um, uh, checked the, the, um, the underlying kind of implication of the question itself. So, Dr. Henry, why is the BC testing rate significantly less than Ontario, Quebec? For other countries. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, because we're not focusing on testing rate as a, a metric that actually it, it, it can be um, not particularly helpful, to be honest. Uh, we, our testing strategy has focused on making sure those people who need a test get it as rapidly as possible. And we've evolved our testing strategy and we've been very open about that. At the beginning, we had limited capacity. We needed to focus on uh, understanding when we were having introductions. And then when we uh, moved to restricting travel, uh, we needed to focus on the health system, protecting the health system. That meant we tested people who were likely to end up in hospital and uh, healthcare workers because we had, again, limited capacity. And our, our testing rates went up. We were like about 8 or 9% at, at the peak. Um, with, with very low testing numbers, meeting our capacity, and that was good. That meant that we were testing the people that needed it. Through the summer, as, we, as our curve came down and we had, um, and, and the other viruses went away, at the time that we were testing, uh, you know, at eight percent, most of, of 100 tests that were done, 20 of them were influenza positive, and one of them would be COVID positive. So that was making things complicated. In the summer, we didn't have influenza. We don't have a lot of the other respiratory viruses. So we opened up our testing again to anybody with symptoms. 
And we focused on that because we knew that there's no way to really find asymptomatic people unless they're linked to a case or a contact. So our asymptomatic testing was focused on outbreaks, being able to understand long-term care homes. Uh, we had an outbreak in uh, temporary farm workers in a shared accommodation. We had outbreaks in uh, poultry processing plants in uh, correctional facilities. And we, um, anybody who was exposed and at risk, we did testing in that group of people. And now as we're heading back into cough and cold and flu season, um, we need to refocus again. We need to focus on ensuring that uh, children are assessed when they go to school we, and people at work and uh, people with the right constellation of symptoms because we have learned from Ontario, we've learned from Alberta, that when you do a whole lot of asymptomatic testing, the yield is exceedingly low and it uses up a lot of resources. Um, some of which are still in short supply across the country, so reagents, for example. Um, and now you've seen that Ontario, Quebec, Alberta have all pivoted to be more aligned with what we're mm -hmm. doing now, too. Just a quick comment to say that um, it's not, you can't test your way out of everything. And part of the challenge is being able to be focused in what you're doing and learning what is the best strategy. So I know that there's uh, the movie industry and other industries where testing it has become a tool to try and induce that safety. We need to learn what is the best strategy. So one of the things that is being approached now um, with the federal government having bought these, um, these rapid tests is uh, to, to open up travel using testing strategies, etc. But it seems the rapid tests have the problem of not being that reliable. So, Colin, that, that uh, mm. might be a very difficult question to answer. So you're able to identify an antibody that is obviously effective uh, against the virus in a relatively short time frame. So why is it so hard to develop a test <laughs> that actually is acting rapidly and reliably with the right level of specificity and sensitivity? Uh, uh, that's a terrific question. It's one probably uh, Mel will also have some insight in, but... Um, you know, the, there, are, there are multiple challenges. First, you have to decide what exactly are you looking for. And there are different types of tests, some that try to detect a virus, some that detect a pre-existing immune system. And then to detect the virus, is it uh, an antibody-based test or a gene genetic test? Um, uh, all those methods can work, and they all have different time frames. Uh, but once they are developed in a format that is, uh, you know, point of care that someone can easily do, that is inexpensive, manufactured and distributed, uh, that is, that's a big part of it, but not the only part. One also has to cross-validate it and get you know, the clinical studies to make sure that it is accurate. Um, all of that takes time. So uh, I, I know that uh, when, when the pandemic first came out, we all wanted to have these tests immediately. Um, and they were uh, you know, much too slow compared to what we would want or what we needed. Uh, but at the same time, when they did come out, if you look at the regular time it takes to develop these tests, it was very fast, as mm -hmm. everything has been in this pandemic. Uh, and the only way to make that faster would be uh, to, you know, put some real effort into innovation and technology that was somehow different and to have the pre-existing networks in place, uh, as well as capacity to manufacture. Um, you know, on, on our front, it's for therapeutics, and that was laid, the foundation of that was laid uh, through the U.S. government and then supported by the government of Canada when it came time to really, uh, you know, accelerate the work and make sure that we could continue our work at social distancing. Uh, maybe similar things are required in the in the testing side. Which comes back to preparedness. I'm sure you have a comment on that, Mel. <laughs> well, there's been a tremendous amount of discovery in the testing sphere, and, and I'll just give you an interesting example. So uh, there are, with the normal PCR test, you have repeated cycles of heating and cooling. Well, there's these isothermal uh, tests, and so one of the solutions for third world countries is you put it under your armpit, and it keeps the temperature and allows you to do the test. And I just say that facetiously, but those are some of the things that you need to bring together in terms of technology. I think ultimately what, what you need to be able to do is improve the sensitivity of the antigen tests and the point of care nucleic acid tests. There are some that are now being available, such as the Abbott test that has been purchased by the federal government. And we just, again, need to figure out where do you use it, which populations are best served by it, how do we get those results into the systems so public health can 
uh, know what's going on in, in the province. And those are some of the challenges. And, and we've been talking about this because we know we're going to get uh, a, two different types of tests uh, uh, available in BC very soon. And it, some of it will be helping us understand what's going on in rural and remote communities, in particular First Nations communities. If we have a cluster of people who are sick, um, it takes sometimes days to get a, mm -hmm. an NP swab down to the lab. So the, the ID now would be a, a, a perfect one, the Abbott test, to have um, at the health center um, where you could do it. You know, it's not high throughput. You can only do maybe three or four an hour. But if you do four or five and they're all negative, that is the negative predictive value is pretty good. And it's probably not COVID you're dealing with. If you get one positive, then you know that it's COVID. So being, being able to use it to help identify outbreaks, whether in schools, whether in uh, long-term care homes and more remote communities, those are some of the strategies we're looking at right now. Some of the issues also, um, that virus is not the same virus that we had uh, back in February or January. So um, uh, these tests and the vaccines, uh, the question is also, will they continue to be effective um, against the specific virus as we know it today. So it's kind of two, two questions that came up. It's kind of uh, the evolution of the virus since it was first detected uh, earlier this year or late last year. And do you observe any significant changes in the strains of the virus uh, as we have this spike now compared to the one that we had uh, in the spring? So <clears throat> this virus tends to mutate fairly slowly, typically two mutations uh, in a month. And uh, compared to the original strain that was um, found in China, um, the strain has evolved from, there's a, one particular mutation, the D614 uh, uh, to G mutation that has basically now circulating globally. And that region does affect the spike protein, which is important. And I think the notion of genomics being able to monitor for these changes and mutations and that understanding how these might affect the vaccines and things like that is a component of the kind of surveillance that the system needs to ensure that uh, it, it hasn't mutated in a way that will impact the immunogenicity of the, vac of the virus and also the vaccines that are being produced. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, move from the science to the, to the social sciences aspect uh, of, uh, of, that, um, of that pandemic. So we, now the kids have been to school for uh, about two months or so. And uh, based on what you have seen, Bonnie, um, do you think we have to make adjustments uh, to the protocols that are in place, be it from an epidemiological point of view or be it from a just operational point of view? Yeah, you know, this is something that we're watching very carefully. Um, and we've had, uh, from the very beginning, we've said we're, you know, we're going to be wor working very closely with schools. And our role in public health was to put in ba place the basics of the different layers of protection in a school environment. And then every school has done things slightly differently depending on their size and the structure and the building and the ventilation and other things. Um, so it is in some ways a, a way to understand which are the important factors. So we have been monitoring and we've been posting publicly every exposure event. So anytime somebody, uh, whether a staff person, a teacher, an educator or a student had, was in a school environment during their infectious period, we've been posting that and we've been following up on every single one of those. And uh, they reflect, and what we're learning, um, which is what we understood, that it reflects um, the transmission in the community. So communities where there's more transmission, there's more exposure events in schools. But we've had somewhere in the vicinity of 200, and we're probably up to about 240 exposure events in uh, close to 3,000 schools, 600,000 children, and uh, another 35,000 teachers and, um, and staff. And we've had half a dozen uh, where there's been a transmission to one other person in the school and we've had one outbreak. So I think we are learning a lot 
We're going to learn a lot from that outbreak. It's in a school in the interior, and it looks like there may have been more than one exposure event that went unrecognized. But uh, you know, the investigation of each of these has helped us understand that the measures that are in place are working. It's been stressful, and I I get that. It's stressful for parents. For I actually think that the kids are the ones that are doing really well with this, and they're adaptable, and they're figuring it out, and they're they're uh, you know they're wearing their masks, they're keeping their distance, they're modifying their games. I was learning some of the ways that the kids were modifying games to be able to safely play instead of tag. It was shadow tag, things like that. Um, but it's been really hard for the staff and teachers for public health, and we're we're getting used to it, and we're working through mm. it together. And uh, so far, I think it's been a, a tremendous success. And I'm really, my uh, admiration and gratitude goes to all of the teachers and educators, the principals and the, the staff and the schools that are making this work because it is so, so important for kids. Yeah, I mean, uh, Carl, you, as, as the CEO of a company that ha has probably more work than you ever had in yes. the past, uh, you must very much appreciate the fact that uh, the, the kids of, of your staff can go to school and what difference it makes. Uh, we have also seen that uh, uh, women particularly suffer under uh, uh, school closures uh, mm -hmm. professionally. So, Carl, what do you see from, if you look at your staff, uh, from a burnout um, yeah. point uh, of view? That's a great question, and you, you try to watch that closely, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say there, there's two competing factors there. One is the uh, the intensity of the work and the pressure and the stress that is layered on top of all the things you just mentioned. So having to um, you know, deal with, uh, with social distancing and being at home and childcare, um, which has been going on not just recently, but since early March when this was really the most intense. Uh, the other you know, counterweighing factor is uh, a galvanizing effect amongst the team uh, pulling together and feeling like they're actually making a difference in the world. And I think that goes a long way. So. Um, you know, I, I personally, as a CEO, am, uh, you know, could not be more proud of how everyone has pulled together, uh, tried to cover, uh, cover for each other when there, there are things at home that, that require um, someone's time, and, um, and really, you know, delivered on a problem that the whole world is working on and did it uh, almost flawlessly, uh, and it needed to be done flawlessly. So, uh, so I, as I said earlier, you know, resilience is one of the things that I, I really took away from that. Um, you know, now that uh, things are going a little bit back to normal and kids are being able to go back to school, uh, it definitely takes the pressure off. But uh, I'd say by, by no means is the pressure completely off. So I'm still very, uh, very wary of that. Uh, and one of the other things that we haven't really touched on or is a little bit different is uh, it is, um, you know, it is uh, uh, challenging to maintain a, a tight team when you don't get to see each other in mm -hmm. person. So uh, trying to find opportunities in suitable spaces to get the teams that work together to come and make that personal connection. It makes the communication better and you feel much more part of a unit. And I think that's one of the really important things that uh, many people are feeling across many industries. Yeah, and I think uh, there has been a lot written about, oh, the days of the office are over and uh, we'll, we'll be working from home in oh. the future, etc. And I think the longer we go into that, we realize how important these daily personal connections are and how much we, we inspire one another and uh, energize one another uh, through the personal yes. contacts and that's not happening in a, in, a, in, a, in a virtual world. So I think before we, before we kind of uh, shut down all the offices, I think we, we, wanna, we wanna live through that and then see how we come out of that. And talking about pressure, I mean, the BC Centre for Disease Control uh, is, is under tremendous pressure these days. Uh, it's because we forget uh, COVID is just one issue you deal with. Uh, the, other, uh, the other issues you're dealing with on a daily basis are not going away. So how do you manage at the BCCDC email? I think it's a similar... And, ...and their families, and, and that affects um, the ability to do the work that needs to be done. Uh, all of the, the gaps in terms of the processes that exist within our province uh, are amplified. In the early phase of this epidemic, uh, because pandemic, what happened was um, the hospitals were shut down, and so as we're seeing patients, so that you could reshuffle staff. And now, as we try to maintain a, a fully functional healthcare system, 
that does create demands on the system. And it highlights that without some of the use of more effective technology, that you can lead to staff burnout and overworked staff uh, because it's just an enormous amount of work because everything is, is important. And there's a bunch of unintended consequences, like the sexually transmitted diseases are continuing. So even though they're wearing masks, <laughs> they still uh, engage in certain contacts. So I think that they're very, it's important to keep a, a holistic and comprehensive support for your healthcare system. And that leads me, um, it's also a combination of, of, of questions. Uh, one of the challenges is, um, if we look at the population, you, you, you alluded to that, uh, Bonnie, there is very different populations in BC. There's also fragmented healthcare system. There's different health authorities. And there is people who live in Vancouver where healthcare is, is readily available. And there is li people living in, in remote communities. There's, there is parts of the population that are dealing with much more underlying conditions than others. So uh, from a public health point of view, how do we address these inequities uh, and make sure that uh, we all get uh, the support uh, from the public health care yeah. system that we require? And, you know, and I think that is incredibly important. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier that this pandemic has really exposed a lot of inequities in what we call the social determinants of health. We know people who um, are living in poverty uh, are more differentially affected. We know indigenous people are. We know that there's systemic racism in our healthcare system that makes many of them feel it's not safe to get tested for COVID if I'm sick or to go to the hospital. So those are all things that have been exposed through this pandemic. We know that many of our essential workers are not just healthcare workers. Um, there are people who do the chicken mm. processing or drive the, That, they, that other populations are infected. So we very much have a, an underlying um, ethical framework for how we're making sure that we can um, uh, make it ex at least accessible to everybody as equally as we possibly can for those in need. And, and some of that is driven, uh, has driven things like our testing strategy to make sure that we do have it available for those people who need it in a safe way. It also is that we're doing in public health and, and how we um, provide information about where cases are happening because we have an overriding obligation to protect people. And we see that for some people in a crisis like this, um, it brings out uh, their, their um, stigma and uh, othering of people. And we saw that in behavior towards Asian populations, towards uh, certain other populations that have become affected. And we see it now in some school exposures where people are telling their, uh, their, their um, contacts that they tested positive and they're getting nasty messages and notes and you know I've seen it personally. So we have to make sure that uh, how we do things continues to build trust so that people are able to come forward and get the care they need when they need it. And that's an uh, overriding thing that we've been working on in public health. So we have about uh, five minutes left, Oops. and um, I kind of would like to close off with a question. I haven't prompted you for that one. So, um, so if you if you think ahead, 20, 30 years, and you're you are rightfully uh, retired, perhaps, and you sit on the porch, and you talk to a, to a grandchild who says, "So you lived through the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, what stood out the most for you? What do you think your answer will be?" Uh, once you look back with a healthy distance uh, from what we are living through right now? Hmm. I probably should have prompted you for that. Well, actually, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll uh, give it a try. Um, you know, just thinking about that now, it occurs to me that uh, you know, hardly a generation has gone by in, uh, in uh, recent history, certainly, uh, if not long history, where there hasn't been some uh, very dramatic uh, event, something that you know people will remember. And it could have been World War II, it could have been World War I, uh, it could have been um, you know, Spanish flu, which came shortly after World War II. So uh, very often there are things like this, and I, I suspect COVID-19 is like that. Um, you know, thus far, not as 
not as horrendous uh, in terms of loss of life as some of those that I just mentioned. Uh, economically um, comparable, certainly. Uh, and I think one of the things that probably always comes out is that uh, in times of crisis, you get to see people's mettle. You get to see, do they stand up? Uh, do they work together and do they find solutions? Um, and while we haven't been perfect, I think there's many examples where we have done that. And we've done it in BC. Uh, it's been done in the US. It's been done in other countries. Um, not perfectly, but uh, if we were uh, you know, to try to look at the glass half full, I think there's a lot to be proud of that's been done so far. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll come out of this better calibrated for the future. So um, that's what I'd say. I'd say, you know, um, this pandemic will define 2020, but it won't define us as a population. And we have learned about resiliency, we've learned about adaptability, we've learned about um, that there's still joy in the midst of this tremendous uncertainty that's going on for a long time. We've seen heroic people supporting each other and communities coming together. And we have an opportunity that we've exposed some inequities in our culture and our communities and we can take this and build back better and more just and i would like to be in 20 years saying this was a turning point where we recognized how we could be a better community how we could be more just and and more fair i think one of the things that uh, this event has done is brought out both the best of people and also you see some of the worst in people but in listening to the radio this morning and hearing a mother uh, hearing a woman who is in an old age home and how important it was to be in contact with her family and to be able to have those human contacts it illustrated uh, why we're here and we are here to help each other and really we need those human and social contacts to make the world better. And uh, ideally, we want to focus in on getting the best of us in the future. I, I really appreciate uh, the conversations uh, that we had in the context of this Donrick's keynote address. And I think reflecting on, on your comments and um, the, so you come here, you have given very generously your time to us. And you have, you have proven to be so reflective on this stressful situation. And I have to admit, I, I admire your, your calm amid the storm uh, for all three of you. Uh, because what's going on is, uh, is, is unprecedented. It's, uh, it's, in a sense, it's frightening. And on the other hand, we also know that one day it will be over and will go beyond that. And uh, I can only tell you how grateful and glad I am uh, to live in a place where there are people like you uh, who do this tremendous amount of work, uh, be it in the private sector, be it uh, in, in the BC Centre for Disease Control, or be it as our public uh, health officer. So I can only thank you for what you do on a daily basis. Thank you for joining us here and for giving us all the opportunity to learn so much more about your work and, uh, and what you do. And uh, this is my perfect opportunity uh, to turn it over uh, to the chair of our board, uh, Dr. John Shepard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. I'm John Shepard and I'm privileged to be the chair of the board of Genome British Columbia, where we work with industry, academia and government to solve the challenges of genomics for health for British Columbians and Canadians, as well as the rest of the world. This is the 20th anniversary of Genome BC, and we had a number of activities planned, including today's Don Rick's distinguished keynote. Unfortunately, because of unforeseen circumstances, we have had to, as Pascal said, pivot. But this has actually allowed us to change our format in a way that I think we will all agree has actually come out to our advantage. We've had a far larger crowd present and registered for today's session than we would have. In fact, with over 1,100 participants registered, and I know for a fact that that goes to people who are as far away as New Zealand, for example. I'd like to thank the staff of the Communications Department of Genome BC, also the technical staff who've been so instrumental in setting today up and running it so smoothly, and particularly to give thanks to Brad Lyle on behalf of the board for the work that he's done in this regard. 
I want to focus before we get to the thanks on three things that I think came out of the conversation today that are important. And the first was around speed. And Mel addressed this in his very early comments when he talked about genomic sequencing. We were actually very pleased in January of this year to be able to provide funding to Mel, Natalie Prestigecki, and others at the BC Centre for Disease Control to do the first genomic studies of patients in British Columbia, which as Bonnie stated during the conversation, was important to understanding the epidemiology of the epidemic in British Columbia. Rapidly after that, we put together a rapid response program, which, as Pascal has alluded to, received a large number of applications, and from which we were able to fund 13 projects to a total of $1.8 million with an incredibly short turnaround time. And I'm grateful to the staff of Genome BC who worked tirelessly over that period of time to turn these projects around, in some cases as quickly as 48 to 72 hours. Carl mentioned the speed that was happening in industry as well. And a good example was his comment about the one month that it took to sign the agreement between Abcelera and Eli Lilly. My first thought when Carl said that was, boy, that's fast. And my second thought was, boy, the lawyers must have been having a fit. But it was an example of exactly how things have worked during this period of time. Similarly, governments have been extremely flexible and quick, for instance, with drug and vaccine approval processes now beginning to look at these in staged processes while at the same time ensuring that they do not drop safety standards. The second thing which I think was important to note was the unique ecosystem that we work in in British Columbia and how well integrated it is. From the level of the ministry, the provincial health office, the health authorities, municipalities, everyone has worked together, particularly with the leadership of the BC Centre for Disease Control, to allow us to collect evidence, to do studies, and to be able to try to manage the pandemic as best we possibly can. Again, Carl spoke about this as well with regards to his particular outreach to Eli Lilly and to other companies, and I know that this is happening in this sphere as well. And then the last thing I want to mention is the comment that was made about how we need to plan for pandemics and at the same time avoid becoming too insular with regards to globalization. And I thought about this when Mel was talking back in March and April, most of us only thought about globalization with regards to pasta and toilet tissue. But the fact is that people like Mel were thinking about platforms for sequencing reagents Staff like Carl or people like Carl were thinking about things like staffing, computer power, ability to generate the antibodies that they're looking for. And Bonnie and her staff, as well as the Ministry of Health, of course, were looking at critical issues around PPE and similar things to protect British Columbians and especially our healthcare workers. So I think it's important that we, as I said, look at preparing for the next pandemic because there will be another pandemic, as has been stated, but at the same time that we not become so insular that we lose the ability to cooperate across the globe, that we do that all within an element of being aware of the ethical framework, as Bonnie has said, and that at the same time, we are always aware of potential, again, as Bonnie says, unintended consequences. So with that, I'd like to thank our panel, and as a gesture of our appreciation for sharing your insights today, I'd like to present you each with this talking stick, hand-carved by Coast Salish artist Jim Yelton. The talking stick, used in many indigenous cultures, is an ancient and powerful communication tool. The person holding the stick, and only that person, is designated as having the right to speak, and all others must listen respectfully. Talking stick symbolism is ripe with spirituality and tradition, and while each First Nations culture, traditions, and history is unique, there is some shared or common symbolism attached to the carvings. These particular sticks include carvings of the eagle, the bear, the wolf, the raven, and the killer whale. The eagle symbolizes leadership, strength, focus, and prestige. The eagle also represents friendship and peace to all. The bear represents strength, family, vitality, courage, and health. The wolf is a symbol of leadership and intelligence. He's a leader of the people and shows us strength in relationships and the importance of strong family values. And the killer whale symbolizes harmony, longevity, and strong community. The orca is also said to protect those who travel away from home and lead them back when the time comes. The raven symbolizes creation, 
transformation and knowledge, as well as the complexity of nature and the subtlety of truth. He also symbolizes the unknown and shows that every person sees the world in a different way. The raven was often called upon to clarify truths in visions, as the wise elders knew that what the eye sees is not always the truth. So with that, I'd like to thank Mel, Bonnie, and Carl for their superb presentations today and hand it to Sally to wrap up. Thank you. And so this concludes the keynote portion of our program. We hope you've enjoyed the conversation. We encourage you to continue the discussion by way of the networking tool available through our website. Click connect on the menu to browse the registrant directory. There, you can set up a face-to-face -face video chat with other attendees. See the help tab for more information on how to connect. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Mel Karadjian, Carl Hansen, and Bonnie Henry, true distinguished keynotes. And thank you to Genome BC's Dr. Pascal Spothelfer for facilitating the conversation and tonight's Q&A session. Let me close by borrowing the words of Dr. Bonnie Henry. Be kind, be calm, and be safe. Good night, everybody. <laughs>